So one of the, the key features of the maker movement that I've found very interesting is the, this concept called maker spaces. And they are spaces in your district, your region, your area, that people gather and either hack on stuff or work on stuff or share ideas and collaborate. Think of it as like GitHub, but in real life. And uh, that's a good sort of analog. In fact, what we're going to have for the rest of the evening is basically a pop-up hackerspace. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we provided some sort of great overview, and I couldn't think of anyone better than Max Wallace. Whoa, that was nice. Thank you very much. So um, as was mentioned, I'm Max Wallace, and I have the pleasure of speaking to you today because I have started a hackerspace in North Carolina that went on to win a Guinness World Record and is still not on fire today. And I'm currently starting in, thank you, thank you. One thing hackerspaces do teach you is the fire suppression systems in every room you're in. For example, we have sprinklers with hail on assist, which is really nice. And uh, hopefully we're gonna have that next door too. And I'm also currently starting the third hackerspace in San Francisco because a city that has 11 grilled cheese joints really needs more than two hackerspaces. So wish me luck on that one. Uh, show of hands, anybody been to their local hackerspace? Anybody familiar with it? Anybody read the magazine? Okay, you guys are gonna be bored to tears. Uh, the rest of you hopefully will pick up on something and find something to do next Tuesday. So we'll start out with what's a hackerspace? Well, to put it bluntly, they look like this. It's a nice big room, lots of bad tables that have been salvaged out of people's garages, leftover computers, soldering irons, some really interesting projects, and these guys over here in the corner scheming, but we'll get to them later. So a hackerspace is essentially an open center for community and creative expression. It's also like crawling into the mind of an eight-year-old with a grown-up and all the best toys. It's everything you could possibly want to be if you've ever wanted to make something, create something, how to engineer something. It's a room full of very interesting people that we'll get to later with very interesting skill sets, some of whom you've met and chatted about already, who are just getting together for the fun of it to see what they can get together on a weekend. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's great. You'll love it. I guarantee there's one near you because there are over 1,700 in the world nowadays 417 in the US, and I believe 42 opened last month alone. So somewhere near you, there is a hackerspace. The picture I showed you is from the hackerspace in Santiago, Chile. There's a hackerspace in Jacksonville, just over there. There are hackerspaces in Singapore. There's, a hack there's six hackerspaces starting up in China. There's one in Tokyo with their, you can imagine how that does. And as I mentioned, I think there's seven or eight in the Bay Area so far. Now the interesting thing that I want to share with you guys and the real crux of the, the point I want you to go away with is a hackerspace isn't about the tools that are in the hackerspace. I love 3D printers, I love quadcopters, I'll probably be over there with Nodecopter all day tomorrow, but the technology that you get to play with in a hackerspace isn't necessarily the bit that makes the hackerspace. What makes the hackerspace is it's community learning. It's people who come together to teach each other what they want to know after work just for the fun of it so that you can learn the fun of doing it too. It's the same reason why Chris has encouraged everybody to learn different skills and talk to different people so you can broaden your mind a little bit because it's absolutely thrilling to learn stuff. And so with that, I have to tell you that while the hackerspace movement modernly started in the early 2000s in Germany after reunification, it was brought to the US in 2007, it is by absolutely no means new. I've done a little bit of research, crawled around the Yale archeology span labs, and what I've found is two candidates for what I think are the earliest hackerspaces possible. This is the Bayat al-Hikmah, which stands for House of Wisdom. It was formed in 810 CE by the Caliph al-Rashad, uh, really got flourishing under his brother in 833 BC. There are five books from antiquity that we only have because they were bootlegged and copied into Arabic in the Bayat al-Hikmah. And there are some projects that they took on, that we'll, one I'll show you later, but the other one, an estimate of the size of the world. This, the estimate was a little bit off. They were maybe 15 or 20,000 miles out of the way. But the algebra that they used to do it is still with us today and being inflicted on an 11-year-old as we speak. <laughs> the older version, though, which is really interesting, is this place called Tukshila. And Tukshila is in northwest Pakistan. It's about 1,600 years old. And this place, I really think, was the genesis of the modern hackerspace movement. This was a collection of the smart people in the area, as they tend to be. But there wasn't like a college curriculum. There weren't majors. People just taught what they thought they knew to people who thought they wanted to learn it. The students kind of figured, you know, well, when I'm sick of learning this, I'll either go do something with it or I'll go teach something else or I'll just go home. And what I think was really interesting is it was open to the public. They had a two-tier membership model. If you, paid, if you paid your tuition dues, you got to go to class during the day. 
Not necessarily the greatest benefit in the world, but there you go. Unfortunately, the Mongol horde sacked it in about 1300, and um, well, that was the end of that one. So, as we mentioned, the tools, not so much. The people, the people are really where the fun's gonna get to. Everybody's talking about, well, what are you gonna make tomorrow? We really should be saying, well, what are we gonna come up with? Because enough people who can all get, their, all get their fingers on this stuff and really start going with it, it's gonna be really great. So just for a couple of examples from uh, storytelling time, if you put a retired surveyor, a house painter, a computer science student, and a chemistry graduate in a room together, what do you figure they're gonna do? Any ideas? Some kind of machine? Some kind of toy? What they're actually gonna do is paint the world's largest QR code on a rooftop over the course of three days. And then the resulting QR code was so large it had to be scanned by a helicopter in order to be verified for the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, Raquel over there actually did a deal with the news station to trade off their traffic helicopter for the story. And I can guarantee that if you've ever been filmed by a circling helicopter like in 1992's November rain, it is fantastic. <laughs> so there's example one. Thank you. Example two is a ham radio enthusiast, another CS grad, because you've got a lot of those, and a DJ. Something sound, something radio. What you actually wind up with is near space photography. Uh, started out in the early 2010s, in I believe Hack DC. Uh, this, this example comes to us from the Las Vegas Hack, not Las Vegas, I'm sorry, uh, Mesa, Arizona hackerspace. Uh, the ham radio enthusiast attached a radio to a high altitude weather balloon. The CS grad took that ham radio data, streamed it off to a Google Maps so they could chase the thing when they found it, and the DJ let go of it until it flew 90,000 feet in the air, and then he drove the car to go get it. So, huge amount of fun. Everybody loved getting their hands on this one, and they all learned a little bit about ham radio, satellite photography, and probably the greatest bragging story ever told. And then a personal favorite of mine, three brothers, underemployed, just out of college, don't really have too much going on. Uh, what they actually do is they go to the Bayat al-Hikmah in 844, and they write a book called The Book of Ingenious Devices. The Book of Ingenious Devices, some of the earliest control theory, programmable automata, et cetera. But I particularly like this example from it, which is a water jug where you pour the water in the top, it collects at the bottom until the air pressure let in by the tubes gets strong enough that it fires a jet up past the wheel and sprays whoever was pouring water in in the face. <laughs> this is a 1,400-year-old practical joke that came out of a hackerspace, and I'm gonna try to make it if I can get it 3D printed. And then the most modern one I'm aware of is 26 of these places all around the world who've all decided to get together and work on a common goal. And the result is gonna be the Hackerspace Space Program. Step one is a worldwide communications network. Step two is a man in orbit. And step three is to land a man on the moon in the year 2034. I don't know how they're gonna do it, but I'm pretty sure they're going to. So, that makes a hackerspace, a workshop where really interesting people explore the boundaries of technology by getting together and doing stuff with it. So, to paraphrase, it's where really bright people get together to write on the world in the ink of their imaginations. I don't know what the ink is, but they're gonna do something with it. You're all in a hackerspace, as Chris mentioned, tonight, most of tomorrow, and possibly some of Sunday if you're lucky. So get into the spirit of community technology, knock some stuff together, see if you like it, and then go to your local hackerspace on Tuesday evening. There are design patterns to these places. Hackerspaces.org is the main website where you can pull up information about the whole thing, or you can watch a 20-minute version and much better delivered talk that Mitch Altman did at a TEDx in Brussels, or you can meet with me tomorrow at noon, 3 and 6 p.m. We'll get together, talk about hackerspaces, tell stories, and have laughs. Thank you very much.